Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list. Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. 
What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple of chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. So, Enrique, have you started your research project on cities yet? I've done a bit of reading around the topic and made a few notes. But, if I'm honest about it, I really haven't done as much as I'd have liked to because I'm finding it a bit difficult. <laughs> you don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. I feel the same way. I think the key is to be able to make valid research questions. You're probably right about that. Didn't we have some lectures on how to write research questions? I think it was towards the beginning of the term. Yes, we did. I've got my notes somewhere in this file. I tell you what, why don't we look at the notes together and then try and come up with some research questions? At least that would be a good starting point. Give us some sense of where we're going with this. Brilliant idea. Let's get started. OK. From what I remember, a good research question is all about knowing from the outset what it is you're trying to find out. Yes. And now that I'm looking at my notes again, I see I've written here that it's to do with understanding and Evaluation. So, understanding a particular issue and evaluating any problems around it. And of course, a very important part is not overlooking any research that has already been done. Past research is just as important as what is being done now. It's a bit, I suppose, like looking at the research that's already been done and seeing if it agrees or disagrees with your own ideas. Mm, sure, I hear what you're saying. But to do that properly, you have to have a clear idea in your head what your own research question is. And by that, I mean uh, specific areas you want to focus on. Let's face it, there's so much information out there and we can't possibly include it all in 2,000 words. Oh, don't remind me. The thought of writing 2,000 words at the moment seems like a huge mountain to climb. I know, but let's try to make a start. I think we're meant to be identifying what makes a successful city and also try to explain why there has been such a steady population movement of people from rural to urban areas. But I'm a bit confused because I don't think this is meant to be the main focus of our research. Mm. Perhaps that's why the lecturer said we need to write questions and that must be our starting point. OK. Well, what we're investigating is more than simply what elements make a city successful, 
but we're also trying to offer possible explanations. So we have two questions: Why do people want to move to cities, and why do people choose to live in them? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay then, I think the first issue concerning successful cities must be the economy.、Uh, people move to cities for better job prospects, and successful cities are cities that have thriving economies. That's true enough. It does mean that cities can offer good job opportunities, which seems to me. To suggest that a city will only be successful if it attracts the right kind of people to work there. What kind of person are you talking about? Well, I suppose I'm referring to the skilled labour force. You know, the idea that up-and-coming young people will move to cities, settle there, maybe buy property, and so that city will get the most talented, creative minds. But. If a city doesn't offer this, then obviously it will lose out, as university leavers will choose elsewhere. You could be right there, but I also think that when cities encourage businesses to develop, then you obviously have money pouring into the city, which can raise the general standard of living. So we've definitely got a question worth investigating. But. Apart from the economic factor, I think another point worth mentioning is the environment. Sure, we can research areas like the quality of the air, how clean it is, and then there's traffic. Um, is there too much traffic? How is it controlled? And also the issues of noise pollution and how the city manages its waste. Um, oh, and I nearly forgot. The environment includes green spaces like parks. Those are all valid points, but I think you've overlooked the whole issue of beauty. Beauty? Are you sure? What's beauty got to do with the environment? Well, don't you think if you were deciding whether or not you would live in a city, your first impressions would be made with your eyes? So the buildings in a city are really important. If the entire city looks like a concrete jungle, then it's unlikely to make people want to live there, is it? I think successful cities are those which have managed to strike a balance between old buildings and new ones. So, of course, you'd have some buildings reflecting more modern architecture, but others that haven't lost their character and still represent the past. You're right, actually. I've often thought that buildings tell a story. I mean, you can tell the history of a place by looking at the buildings. I know exactly what you mean, and let's not forget that the environment includes cultural aspects. So, for example, what's the cultural life like? For me, a successful city will be attractive because it will have lots to offer, like a good nightlife. And a wide variety of places to visit in the day, like museums and galleries, places like that. True, true. My own view is that some cities have an energy about them that exciting to be in. And other cities are the opposite. Well, we've covered so much ground here, but I think there's one final aspect we should research. What's that then? The social aspect, because. Let's face it, cities are made up of people. They are, and surely a successful city would be one where there is a sense of community, a place where people would feel safe and want to raise families in. 
This topic is limitless. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Come in. Sit down. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. Now, this assignment. The best thing we can do, I think, is to think how we can approach it. The main point is to investigate television, but not what's happened in the past. I was thinking that it would be necessary to go over the new media first,、hmm. and then. Yes, that's a way to make a start. But you need to do that quite briefly. But it's quite a complex topic. Yeah, I agree. But the emphasis must be on the future development of television as a cultural phenomenon. Yes, I've been reading the talk by Ashley Highfield. All right, and what do you take from that? What are the things that are competing with television? Well, to start with, there is the games console, then there is the personal computer and the internet,、um, then again the mobile phone with its capability of games and puzzles.、Mm. Um, and of course, internet access. Lastly, there is the iPod with the possibility of listening to music wherever you go. Good, you've understood that. Now, which of these presents the greatest competition for television? Well, according to the research, it's video games. Yes, that's true at present. But in the future, I think the phone will present the greatest threat then. And why? Because it's mobile, portable, and it's developing fast. Yeah, I think you're right. You need always to look to the future and try to assess how things will develop, as we said. Good. Now you need to move on to the new social trends in connection with television. Is one of them the idea that programs might become shorter and shorter? Ah, yes. The, the average program might be ten minutes, or even less. Just mini programs, say four to five minutes long. Now. Do you think you can get access to all the materials you need? The problem at the moment is the library. Oh yes, what's happening there? There's a tremendous amount of noise because of the new extension they are building. It's quite impossible to work there. They are stopping work for a week next week, I believe, and then all the sections will be open. There's a holdup because some roof tiles have not arrived, so there'll be peace for that week. But then after that, the media studies section will be closed for a week, and all the noise and dirt will start up again. Yes, the sociology section will be open, and there's some good stuff there for you on this topic, and it's further away from the noise.、Mm. Yes, I don't think the sociology section is affected at all, and neither is the journal section. No, obviously they're rotating the closures, and it was sociology's turn to close for a week last term. I think we should make a complaint. Yeah, I think you should. I've had a word with the library staff. They are very sympathetic, but they are affected by these works just as we are. If I were you, I'd make a complaint directly to the premises committee. They only meet once a year, but in fact, I know they're having a meeting next Tuesday. You might like to make contact with them, but don't say that I suggested this. <laughs> yes, but the students' union might be better since they are independent of the university. That's true, but I can imagine that people haven't already approached them about this.、Mm. Let's try the premises committee. Good idea. Why not? Okay. Now, don't forget, I need a copy of your dissertations by email and two copies in print—that is, on paper. 
If you give the Repro Graphics office 24 hours' notice, they'll make copies for you. And if you give them my details, they'll send those copies directly to me. They won't send copies to you, so you'll need to take your own copy personally from them. Good. Any questions? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now answer questions 27 to 30. One little thing was just that I wondered whether we should actually talk about that famous website. You know, the one, YouTube. Ah, I was rather hoping you hadn't overlooked that. <sighs> Good point. It's mostly homemade videos. I suppose you could say that each video is a television version of a podcast. Anything else? Yes, I've got a question, I'm afraid. I'm not completely clear about the exact meaning of culture as we are using it in this subject. Well, Mrs. Jones is giving a lecture on culture and society in the University Theatre. It's on Wednesday at 10 a.m., and you can learn all about it there, I'm sure. Can you give us that again, please? Yes, that's Culture and Society. It's in the University Theatre. And um, let me just check the time. Yes, here it is. 10 a.m. on Wednesday. She'll be giving a very thorough discussion of the issues in defining what culture means. Right. That's good. Uh, the thing is, the reading list confused me a bit. One thing that occurred to me was that it might be broken down into subsections for future students. Yes, that's a fair point. I'll bear that in mind. Now, don't forget, you need to do the reading and finish the assignment by the 4th of July. Is that OK? Fine. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now part turns four. to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to 13 weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively.
he investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed, and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes, and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.